Here we are. Here we are. Welcome, everybody. (laughs) Um, With Cecil Tushon, I'm Ann Lewis, Ann Kelly Lewis of William Campbell Gallery. We are here today in Fort Worth, Texas. So, formerly known as... On November the 15th. On November the 15th. 2023. 2023. uh, William Campbell Gallery, previously known, formerly known as William Campbell Contemporary Art, which is when your relationship started here. Right. Just not long ago. Before the internet. Before the internet. And nobody was thinking about how short can you make the name. That's right. That's true. <laughs> well, then it was WCCA, William Campbell Contemporary Art. Because of the internet. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. And domain names and right. that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so tell us about Cecil um, when you're, because I, I think a lot of the listeners already know about you. Uh, But tell us about how your relationship started with this particular gallery in Fort Worth. Well, in from about 1974 to 1977, into 1977, uh, I was at St. Louis Community College at Florissant Valley in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. So one of my teachers there was named Kim Mosley. And I told him that I was hearing and feeling like the Dallas area was going to become the next uh, kind of a big art center for the country. This was, you know, back in the late 70s. And there was a lot of buzz around Dallas-Fort Worth as being a new art area, a lot of big art community down here. So I said, I think I'm going to move down there because my family's originally from Fort Worth. And, uh, and my teacher, Kim Mosley at the time, who currently lives actually in Austin, um, said, well, you know, when you go down to Dallas, look up this guy named Dan Rizzi because he used to be one of my printmaking students at SMU. And you two guys are like two peas in a pot, so you guys should know each other. So I said, okay. So as soon as I moved down, I met Dan Rizzi and you know, we spent a little bit of time together, uh, but, you know, I was already starting to look for a gallery because, you know, you got to be in a gallery if you're planning to be an artist, basically. That's the way it was in those days. And at the time, <clears throat> the art market in general was still completely undeveloped in the United States in the late 70s. There was practically no galleries anywhere in the country except on the East and West Coast, and that was about it. So I felt like the Dallas-Fort Worth area was going to be an up-and-coming important place for the arts, so that's where I came to with the idea of getting in a gallery down here. And I came across uh, the Campbells who had a, you know, their original gallery idea over on Camp Bowie, Mm -hmm. and uh, they were also selling a lot of prints and their, their concept was to have the framing shop and, you know, sell works on paper, which was, you know, of interest to people in general at that time, mm-hmm. works on paper. And uh, so that's what I was making, mostly works on paper, and which naturally worked for Bill Campbell because he had the frame shop. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I, I brought him a portfolio on the Camp Bowie store, and uh, he said, oh, we're, we're actually getting ready to open a new gallery space on Byers Street, so I want you to come back and bring me the work then after we're set up. Which is where we're sitting today. Which is where we're sitting today. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I believe they bought this building at that time, mm-hmm. and then they converted it into an art gallery because it was a house previously. And uh, so it, over the years, has become essentially one of the pioneer, oldest lasting galleries in Texas. Mm -hmm. Contemporary art gallery. Contemporary Mm -hmm. art gallery. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, which my aunt, I mean, my, actually, my first cousin once removed, I guess, my mom's first cousin, uh, is named uh, Cynthia Brantz who was yes. a part of the Fort Worth Circle, Circle Group. Mm-hmm. So she was actually the first modernist in the family. 
And then uh, I did not know that relationship yeah. to Cynthia Brantz. That's wonderful. Yeah. So yeah, she's you know, and I spent time with Cynthia. She you know back years and years and years ago, she had a two-story glass studio mm -hmm. down at the end of uh, Ridgely Country Club, mm -hmm. where the where the family's houses are down there. Uh, my my family pretty much owned almost the entire stretch of property from that street right there. I forget the name of that street that goes out to Vickery. Okay. Uh, at the end of uh, Ridgely Country Club. It's not Brian Irvin. No, not Brian Irvin. But there's a you know the I forget the name of it. But anyway, it goes from there down to Southwest Boulevard. So that whole strip along there was mostly all of it was family property, mm. all the way to my grandmother's house uh, at, at Southwest Boulevard. And then my Uncle Doc had a farm next door to that, and then uh, my uh, other uncles and so forth owned all that property down right around Ridgely Country Club at the end of at the bottom of Ridgely Country Club. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so, um, so Cynthia, you know, was kind of a bit of a legend in the family for being an artist. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, I think my grandmother, seeing how Cynthia was, you know, because that was her niece, my grandmother's niece. Uh, so when she noticed I had an interest in art, you know, when I was eight or nine years old, then she made sure I had plenty of art supplies to work with. And then I spent most summers at their house. Uh, my parents lived in St. Louis at the time. <laughs> but they would bring me down to Fort Worth to stay at my, my grandparents' farmhouse down over on Southwest Boulevard in Vickery. Um, and so I would plot around that whole area down in the pecan groves and the river and so forth uh, when I was a kid every summer until mm -hmm. I was, I don't know, early teenager. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I got started making art and, you know, uh, became interested, you know, in all the fossils and everything that are all over the place around this area. Mm -hmm. And I would collect those and hang out with my uncle at his, his farm next door and that's now a Walmart. Yeah, <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you yeah, know, that's how I got started. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I you know went to school for a while in Fort in St. Louis, and then went to ended up graduating many many years later from uh, UTA at Arlington. Okay. In two thousand nine, so I went to college off and on from nineteen seventy four to two thousand. Yes, well, because I was but, talking with Marilyn Jolly the other day. Uh huh. I don't know if you remember her. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and she mentioned that, and anyway. Yeah, I, I think I took her painting class. You right? did, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah, she's another great artist that lives here. In, yeah. Well, actually in Dallas, but yeah. So you came in and you met Bill and Pam at the frame shop, started selling, showing works on paper with them, and then fast forward a couple of years to here at Buyers. When was your first show exhibition um, at the gallery? And what was that of? Oh, I've slept since then. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, was it all works on paper? It would have been. It would have been. Yeah, okay. Right, at that time. Around like 1983 Yeah, I didn't really take up painting until the mid to late 80s. Okay. But I was, you know, do, doing works on paper and then started making collages mm -hmm. and then started making paintings of the collages. Right. So that's how I got started, like maybe 18, I mean, uh, 1987, okay. 88 was when I really started my painting series. So how did you, tri how did you discover your passion for collage? Well, when did that start? Yeah, I, I mentioned Kim Mosley. Yes. And Dan Rizzi. Yes. And so, when I was hanging out in his studio one time watching him make some collages, mm -hmm. then I, I saw that as a really viable, interesting way to explore the kind of 
composition and imagery that I was interested in because, you know, as a young artist, an artist is often extremely critical of his own hand, mm -hmm. you know, and unsure about it. But the interesting thing about collage was once you had your system set up of what you were going to use and how you were going to use it, then you just became a composer mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, a performer, mm -hmm. which would be drawing and painting. Mm -hmm. So I realized I was more of a composer than a performer. <laughs> sure. In my opinion. Right. That's where my joy was at. And so collage became an uh, important uh, element for me expressing myself through composition as opposed to, uh, you know, performance with pencils and pens and so forth. Although, you know, mm. I still work on that all the time anyway. I mean, you I always do. felt like drawing was my, performance. My, my core, you know, my core artistic skill yeah. and, and way of thinking was drawing. You know, mm -hmm. from the very beginning, mm -hmm. but to the but I didn't really want to draw what whatever I could see. Although I could draw whatever I could see. Once I got to the point I could draw anything I wanted to draw, mm -hmm. then my interest shifted to I want to draw what I can't see. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to figure out how to make music mm -hmm. with drawing, drawing and painting. So that's been an ongoing, continual interest of mine since the late 70s. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's why, you know, you'll find a lot of asymmetric writing and mm -hmm. mu very musically related uh, mm -hmm. drawings, but they're not, it's not drawing in the typical sense of a landscape or no. whatever. It's more yeah. like about reading, <laughs> you know, right. re reading things like you would read a musical score or yeah. a book. Or your right. mind's activity. Right. Almost. With yeah, the so I'm writing. performing, it's a performance when I'm making an asymmetric writing, only the recording is on paper instead mm -hmm. of on film mm -hmm. or and on it's audio. The randomness or not randomness of your mind. Right. Yeah. Just kept capturing the impulses, the mm -hmm. mental impulses mm -hmm. that I'm having through my hand. Mm -hmm. Sure. While I'm, you know, working out rhythms and structures and so forth. Sure. So that's a whole different subject, but the yes, collaging is almost the exact same approach. Mm -hmm. But I'm still looking for all of that musicality mm -hmm. in how the eye moves around the work. And mm -hmm. so I, you know, carefully construct the collages a certain kind of way with certain kind of material that happens to be all typographic, but that's a reference to the idea of reading, mm -hmm. which is related to the idea of musicality and listening. Mm -hmm. um, so you're kind of listening with your eye to the paintings or the asymmetric writings or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's a matter Beautiful. of listening. Because you're listening with your focal point. Right? Mm -hmm. Like if you're listening to music, your attention is on the moment the music's happening and as it goes to the next moment, the next moment, the next moment. And uh, so, as that I found this on the web. Gee, somebody turn that thing off. Okay, so uh, anyway, a lot of my uh, theories related to art making has to do with the focal point and the peripheral vision. Mm. And that the focal point is where you actually see the painting. Just like when you're reading, you can only read one or two words simultaneously, but you can't see the line above and you can't see the line below enough to read it. Right, it's fuzzy. It's fuzzy. Mm -hmm. So. If you look at a painting the same way as a reading, then your your focal point's constantly moving around, and and so I'm playing with the the flips back and forth of positive and negative, and you know you think it's all positive, but then it turns negative, and then it goes back to positive, mm -hmm. and and then what's in front of what, what's behind what, and then is it always behind the other thing or? 
am I pulling a trick on you that it starts in front of one end and becomes the background at the other mm -hmm. end of the shape, you know, things like that. So that's of great interest to me in terms of the communication and conversation that I'm having with whoever takes the time to look at the painting. Mm -hmm. I want to leave a lot of content in there that's totally non-linguistic, but it gives you a constant interplay of abstract mm -hmm. content and action to think about while you're looking at the paintings. That, that's what I think about when I'm making these. It's interesting how you tie all that in with the lettering, and it is abstract. You had, we had spoken earlier about um, you called them um, just the, the original, the modernists from the 20s, like Picasso and Brock, and what they were doing with cubism and, you know, the picture plane and kind of playing with things and, and all of that. And I think that very much helped me understand looking at your work. Because when you look at those, they're using objects that we understand and then playing with the plane and, you know, changing the scale and cubing things off. And then you can kind of understand what they're trying to do, but that, that helps me understand your what you're trying to do with the lettering. Right, and much. you can tell that the cubists were totally about musicality right. and yes. moving at the focal point around the painting because they were breaking up the image mm -hmm. so completely yes. that you had to read the image into the painting. Right. Through all through looking at all the different parts over the course of time. Right. And at the beginning, a lot of their subject matter was straightforward. And I mean, they were using guitar and violin, just telling you, you know, that that's what that that's what it is. Was. They're saying right. this is a violin. I mean, and they're right now. You don't ever really you. hear any historians discuss that part of yeah. the fact that the Cubists were clearly mm -hmm. Picasso and Brock, especially, mm -hmm. were looking at painting from a musical point of view. Right. Mm. Amazing. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not really, nobody thinks about it like that. Mm -hmm. Because, well, there wasn't any language to think about painting that way mm -hmm. at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but people like Kandinsky and so forth got it, and they start, he started talking about, uh, you know, abstract art, which Picasso and Brock didn't want to talk about because they were more thinking in terms of the poetics of musicality, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, they, they still felt like a subject and an object had to be present, or they wouldn't know what it meant except babble. You know, to right. them it would just become babble if there wasn't a subject in the painting. Right, it makes me wonder how they would feel looking well, this, at one of your pieces. One of these pieces know? would have scared those guys and it scared all modern artists at the time. They were quaking in their boots <laughs> trying to understand what abstraction was going to be. Sure, oh yes. And what that meant. Oh, absolutely. And what they're supposed I to mean, do I mean, if they could it. even see what everything else was today. But yeah. I mean, your work specifically though, I think they might have a yeah, so it Connection was a it. massive image crisis right. going on oh, in, sure. in the teens and 20s. Mm -hmm. and everybody, all the artists were freaking out because photography had replaced painting, essentially. Mm -hmm. what, what, could, what could anybody paint that was going to be superior to a photograph? Nobody. Yeah. So then they had to think, well, what are we going to paint now if a photograph is going to do mm -hmm. the job? Mm -hmm. Well, the only thing you can paint at that point is imagination. So that became the subject. And then abstraction became a way to paint things that you couldn't photograph. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So, so we had to carve out, as painters, a whole new territory for mm -hmm. ourselves that uh, photography couldn't compete with. And then, you know, we're going to end up doing the same thing. Artists are going to have this crisis right away pretty soon with AI. Right. And the only way that we're going to outdo AI is continue to explore our imagination. Because mm -hmm. AI can only explore what's already there. Right, exactly. Artists get to explore what hasn't arrived yet. That's right. <laughs> yeah. 
it's a so, great opportunity. So that's our only happen. opportunity for the future because you know AI is going to just kind of crush it on on almost every pretty soon. Mm -hmm. You know, since it's about ten thousand times smarter than humanity at large altogether. Mm. Scary. Uh, we won't even know what questions to ask. We're too stupid to know what well, questions to ask him, AI. We could ask him a question now, but we won't do that. <laughs> um, and then you're just making him smarter when you start asking questions. Exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah, what a great question. Well, so tying back in, so collage. Um, and this exhibition is a little bit different than maybe other exhibitions that you've had. In that there is a greater num there are a greater number of collages, but these are very special and specific. The title of this exhibition is the Cuernavaca Papers. So let's talk a little bit about how what sets these apart and why Cuernavaca Papers. I guess starting with your time or your decision to move to Cuernavaca and when that was. Yeah. So I had had a heart attack when we had a restaurant and. Pagosa Springs, and uh, I got over it. <laughs> Luckily, you know, most forty-year-olds. I was forty at the time. You don't get over a heart attack. Usually, you're dead. But I, I actually had like just a, essentially a crushed vessel that folded or something. It, it collapsed on itself. So they were able to put in a stent, you know. But it cost me to be. It kind of stirred up my heart, my all the emotions in my heart, which was very weird, and caused me to have this tremendous kind of anxiety for about a year. And uh, you know, I was kind of depressed and so forth. So we ended up selling the restaurant and moving to Central Mexico, just you know, to kind of recover and. Mentally. Mentally. Emotionally. And, and just get a yeah. fresh start. And mm -hmm. so we went there. Mm -hmm. So we sold our house in Pagosa Springs, sold the restaurant, and then moved to Cuernavaca, mm -hmm. where my wife was from. Mm -hmm. And our youngest daughter, Nuranisa, our only daughter between Rosalie and I, uh, was about three years old at the time. So... I saw it as a great opportunity for us to let Nisa grow up in central Mexico and become a complete native speaker of Spanish mm -hmm. so that her and her mom could stay in complete communication with each other in her mom's native language. language. That's a great opportunity. Yeah. And, and then to have the experience of Mexico mm -hmm. for her as a child. Mm -hmm. So... That became something that we, we were just going to go for two or three years, but we ended up being there for seven. Oh, my gosh. And yeah. uh, we moved back up to the United States when she was getting ready to go into the fifth grade. Okay. So that, you know, she would come back young enough that uh, she could reintegrate with the American school system and, you know, get her way through high school and go to college, mm. which she did. Mm -hmm. But it was rough on her because, yeah. you know, being... Kind of from two different cultures, uh, you know, it's difficult on a kid. I can imagine. But and at that age. But it gives you this kind of incredible uh, superpower that anybody that just grows up in the same place their whole life doesn't have. Right. You know, yeah. That's it gives amazing. you a lot of resilience and strength and so forth that you may not even know you have as her. Right. <laughs> but right. she's starting to see the advantages of her life growing up. Yeah. Well, so and then yeah. So I love I love hearing that, and I'd love a chance to talk to her again. I've I've met her before. So, but um, one thing you were talking about earlier, and we're surrounded by some of these um, fragments of images, collages of images. When you were driving in to the first time for the first time. Oh yeah. Kind of like what was around you. I feel almost like that's what we're sitting amongst in a way. So right. tell us about that. Well, I, I have written a, about it before, but the experience of leaving the United States with the idea of going down to Cuernavaca, um, which means you have to go through Mexico City. Mm -hmm. So as we went, as we left, and we were headed to 
to Mexico, lived down there for a while. And I, while I'd taken four semesters of Spanish in college, I still didn't know Spanish <laughs> yeah. for whatever reason. Anyway, uh, as we were going, we went through Laredo, and uh, I saw this sign in the rear view mirror as I was driving across Laredo that I saw in the rear view mirror because I didn't see it as we drove past it because it was a billboard, but it was pointed mm -hmm. in, towards, in, that, yeah. towards the direction we were headed in, so mm -hmm. I didn't see it. I just saw the back of it. But when I saw it in the rear view mirror, I actually had to stop, turn around, drive back to look at this amazing billboard mm -hmm. that was deep red with white letters on it that had all been rearranged into an abstract design with this beautiful, I, I still had the, I got out and took a photograph of it, I still have the photograph, I printed it out large and it's hanging on in my studio someplace, and I went, that is cool looking. I said, I think that might be an idea right there for wow. collages. And uh, so we kept going and we drove and drove and drove and drove and we went through Caretaro and eventually we're coming into Mexico City from the north to get to Cuernavaca, which was on the south side of Mexico City over the next, in the next valley. So we're coming out of the dark at three in the morning, coming into Mexico City, and you get to the point in Mexico City where there's all the big buildings and all the lights and the billboards are massively huge. Mm -hmm. But the roads are completely empty because it's three in the morning, mm -hmm. and usually you can't even hardly mo move through Mexico City on the highways because they're so crowded. Mm -hmm. But anyway, there we are driving through the empty highways in Mexico City looking at these amazingly lit billboards, and, and, and I can't really read them. I can tell the logos and whatever of Coca-Cola or who knows what. But a lot of the signs where the advertisers had stopped painting, instead of painting over the signs, they would just go rearrange the four by eight sheets of paneling. Oh my gosh. To destroy the kind message. Of, yeah, kind of end their lease on the, on the board. To end their lease yeah. on the board. So they're not getting any benefit from it, right? Oh, wow. But they didn't do anything to the material, they just moved it around. Moved it around, recomposed it so mm -hmm. that it meant nothing. So they destroyed the literal message, but it kept all of the material. Mm -hmm. So when I saw those, I was just astounded by how interesting that looked. And so that became my new idea that I was going to do in Cornavaca. And the rest is kind of history with your yeah. work. But yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's all, amazing. So all the Cuernavaca papers were me remembering those signs mm -hmm. and then trying to figure out material I could use at a scale that I could use it, not billboard scale, mm -hmm. although I wouldn't like that. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up uh, just ripping all the posters down off of the streets in Cuernavaca for, you know, wrestling matches, lucha libre, and that sort of mm -hmm. thing. And just they too would those. layer up. They would layer up the posters. So you're taking down. Yeah. Layers so when I take layers. down one, I'm taking down an inch deep. An inch deep. Yeah. Where? Because I would wait till the entire wall of posters would start to curl at the edges from being so thick with poster after poster after poster. Mm -hmm. So you don't even know what's on there except what you see it's on the front behind. layer. All hidden behind. Sure. So. But I would go with my van and I would just rip off, you know, the six feet high by 15 foot long section of posters that are an inch thick and roll them up and stick them in the back of my van and drive them back to the studio. And then get them all wet because it's all uh, water soluble glue, okay. you know, paste. Mm -hmm. So all you have to do is get them wet long enough for the paste to soften and then you can pull the sheets of from each other and mm -hmm. then I would just lay them out in the sun 
and mm -hmm. once they dried, then I'd cut them down to size that would fit in a box and then put all the papers in boxes. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of boxes of paper <laughs> from yeah. that I collected so, in a two or three year period. For a two or three year period while you were there. And did you know at the time what you were going to do with those pieces? No, I just knew they were going to be collage They material. were going to be something. Yeah. And so that was like... Became my, you know, my, my colored pencils. You right. Know, basically. You eventually left Cuernavaca and came back. Yeah, so we, we were in Cuernavaca from late 1998 until 2005, mm -hmm. about mid-2005. We, we came back up to here, to Fort Worth, bought a house, so and got here early enough that Nisa could start the fall season at school. Mm -hmm. So I wanted her to go to the same school that my older kids had gone to in grade school. Uh, so we got in that district so that she would go to that same school that, uh, that Zach and, and Brittany had gone to mm -hmm. when we all lived in that same farmhouse that I had gone to every year for the summer. Mm -hmm. um, we were taking care of my grandmother at that point uh, on that same property mm -hmm. uh, in in that farmhouse on Southwest Boulevard. So, um, so I thought that connection of the three of them with the same grade school would be a, a nice thing because all three of them are pretty spread apart uh, by at least by five or six years mm -hmm. between each one of them. So they basically all three of my kids grew up as an only child, essentially. Um, so we got back to Fort Worth in 2005. We still maintained a bed and breakfast down in Cuernavaca that we had been running for another few years. And, uh, you know, then the big crash hit in 2008, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, but we were already set up for a couple of years by then here in the States and got a good price on the house, didn't overspend and so we didn't really have the kind of you know crisis that uh, was going on around the whole country. Everybody's losing their houses, everybody's losing their jobs, the whole thing that was going on in 2008 and we were here for that. But uh, we weren't actually suffering from it. Uh, even though most of the galleries in New York closed down at that time, at least 50% of them, all my galleries all stayed open and everything just kind of kept ticking along. So we were a little nervous at first, you know, because so many people were losing their jobs. But I eventually told my wife, well, we don't have a job, so we're not going to lose our job. And the people that are getting fired the people that are firing them are the ones that buy the art. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, probably not a problem. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, we just ended up so coming here. back up here, and then I brought all my papers up here mm -hmm. from Mexico. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I've been making collages from these same Cuernavaca papers the whole last 20 years. Mm -hmm. But the new thing going on with this set is that I decided to use up this entire box of this paper down to the last sheet, mm -hmm. which would force me into making choices for collages that I would not have done if I were not trying to mm -hmm. completely use up everything. Mm -hmm. So I'm using the front or the back or something here or something there, bettering it under mm -hmm. other things so that I end up with a completely other range of images mm -hmm. that I would not have made when I'm just picking the pieces out for precisely what I want to make paintings from. Yeah, because some of your other collages, uh, you know, previous to these had been like, you know, you might use a pink piece where you need a pink piece and then a, a blue piece here and a yellow piece there to create, you know, abstractions. And these feel so much more thematic because you know you're using either you know all of a single poster or a, 
or a section of a poster, just parts of that to create an image. And so, you know, they almost, you know, particularly the ones that you can really tell, you can really see the lettering. I mean, I know almost all of them are lettering, but it's almost like a language you can't read or something like right. that in a, in a way. Yeah, but they're, they've been, I, they're I had much, a show where I called Reduced to Silence. Reduced to Silence. Where, where yeah. I'm, I'm tearing up the letters enough that you don't hear them anymore mm -hmm. in your head. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. kind of the idea of that. Right. So, yeah, so obviously a lot of these collages are still pursuing my typographic abstraction ideas, mm -hmm. but a lot of other images are coming out because of the fact that I'm using all of the paper and not just only the typography mm -hmm. out of it. Right. So that's creating a whole lot of new approaches of how to end up with a collage that interests me uh, without any concern of it having those specific qualities to it. Right. Like being driven by typography. Right. So yeah. that, that's kind of just the change in attitude and, and allowing chance in general to play a much more important role in papers that I would normally have rejected using. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, so I go, well, what am I going to do with the, you know, this picture of these band members that are in the poster that I would never use right. normally? Right. Uh, how am I going to incorporate those in? Because I've created that limitation on what I'm mm -hmm. trying to use up. You're trying to use them box. all. Trying yeah. to use all of it somehow or yeah. another. So you're challenging yourself. Right. It's a challenge to so, me. Yeah. So do but you, I can also use the back, which is blank. Well, sure, <laughs> the white. Right. So do you feel like as an artist at this point in your career, it's important to challenge yourself? Well, I'm always challenging myself. I just dream up new challenges and, and limitations because mm -hmm. an artist works best within a corral of limitations. Mm -hmm. So I'm constantly creating limitations for myself to turn chance loose within that corral, like I'm training a horse or something. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just going to run off in any direction, but it's going to stay within the confines of my decision making that are only going to have these elements in it. Mm -hmm. You know, then what happens within that? Right. Anything could happen. That's so interesting. It's a great reflection, though. I feel like as people, as humans, we all work best in that way. Right. You know, once we have a place that we feel almost safe within, we could be completely free. To do whatever to you do want. To do anything you want. And that's, that's a great reflection of your work. Right. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah. yeah. I think that, you know, it's... it's They're kind wild, of like, but, but, you know... Right. So, you, and, and you're sort of forcing your creativity into a funnel. Mm -hmm. And then once it comes to the narrow part of the funnel, you've increased the power and pressure mm -hmm. significantly, which lets your creativity be very powerful within that little tiny range that mm -hmm. you're going to try to work within. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the idea. For instance, with this piece, I mean, you're creating something, you know, with the shading and the lines and the planes, something that most of us, I mean, it's, it's unthinkable, but within the type to come up with, the, come yeah, up with yeah. you know, like you don't know which, you know, the shading, you know, which part's on top, which is underneath, what's sticking out, what's layered under, you know, we, you can't tell. Why but, is it like that? <laughs> but within the confines of that being your, your technique, I mean, you're able to really create something very strong. Yeah. And, and unthinkable. That's what I was trying to think of. It. You're, you're creating something that most of us would not. Well, and think even of. unimaginable. Unimaginable. Because I don't imagine yes. it. I I am responding to it. Right. So it's a different approach. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a painter is normally trying to capture his imagination. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to capture imagination. I'm trying to capture limitations that I've mm. set. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find let the chance you know, turn itself loose within my work. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think that's an interesting approach because my paintings are not self-expression. I'm not trying to express myself. Mm -hmm. 
I'm yes. more like a scientist doing an experiment and understanding the limitations I have to place on the experiment to arrive at a successful conclusion. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> you yes. know, to find a certain drug or to find a certain solution or a cure to something, you have to have these very set limitations so that you can focus your attentions very specifically mm -hmm. on That's really thing. interesting, yeah, because there's some artists that, you know, are creating work for themselves. I mean, a lot of artists, which is, you know, wonderful. Um, and I hear a challenge a lot of artists have sometimes is they don't know when it's finished. But with your almost scientific, you know, comparison, you're trying to establish some sort of, you know, resolution and you've... So is it easy for you to know when you're finished? Yes. Okay. Well, it's, it's precisely laid out from start to finish, mm -hmm. my okay. process. Okay. So I know exactly where it starts, and I know exactly when it's finished, and I go through each one of the procedures until I get to the last layer. Mm. So there's many, many layers in the production of one of these paintings. There's a lot of decision making happening, but it's only happening at the layer that I'm working on, those decisions. Oh, really? Okay. Then, I, then once the, all those decisions have been made, then I go to the next layer of the procedure. So you don't worry about other parts of it? No. Just the part you're working on? Right. So the shading. Because that the would just be... shading happens, I only am doing the shading. Mm -hmm. And I look for where the shading is supposed to be. I do all of that. Then I stop. Then I put a coat of, of uh, finish on it mm -hmm. to seal that. And then I do the highlighting. Mm -hmm. Then the highlighting is to some extent extended by the shading because the highlighting is a reaction to the shading, right? Yes. If this is shaded, that means this has light, so that gets light. You add, bump it up a little bit more. Right, to create, to increase the contrast. Mm -hmm. and, and then since this is a collage, then all of the places where the original one piece of collage was, you know, the, all the elements of the collage are located inside of the... So you can see this is one cut yes. rectangle, and it's attached to this, mm -hmm. rec, or this rectangle, mm -hmm. or that one over there, or this one down here. Mm -hmm. And because I keep all of the information of where all the collage parts are, mm -hmm. then that gives the logic for why the whole thing is exactly like it is. Mm -hmm because I'm communicating that it's fabulous yeah. through how the painting is made because mm -hmm. I want you to know it was a collage and that these are the parts that it was made from mm -hmm. and then it has a paper layer beneath it to allow me to do sanding and all of these other things to it mm -hmm. to simulate the sensibility of the collage paper mm -hmm. but amped up to a whole nother level because of all the painterly qualities that are then going mm -hmm. into it with all the shading and the highlighting and the, you know, mm -hmm. brush marks. You know, in the case of some of them, this one doesn't have too much, but you can see a lot of it in the whites especially. Mm -hmm. But I felt like this one needed a pretty solid red, but if you look close, you can still see the sanding marks in the, you know, that reveals the That adds an, just an entirely another layer to it. Yeah. I mean, literally, it's another layer. It's another it's layer. Paper. Because it's revealing the construction of the under paper, the under surface mm -hmm. of the paper, how it's been glued on all mm -hmm. over the... Yeah. That's not related to the image. What I find so interesting <laughs> about this particular painting compared to the other paintings in this show um, is this is of, you know, one of your... Cornabaca papers, where the lettering is so um, pronounced. And I feel like this painting is really a departure because these lines just add a whole other whole other element. Oh, yeah. That Absolutely. some of your other paintings don't. I mean, I, I love the, the paintings that are in the show, obviously, but the, the addition of this line for this particular graphic, this right. Tecate label, it just adds... That I haven't a whole really, other dimension. I haven't really done before. No, never. I've never um, seen a painting like this of and, yours. And the odd thing is, is, you know, it just looks like, well, it's just a bunch of little lines in there. But, but it actually not. vastly increases the amount of effort to mm -hmm. make the painting. I, 
particularly in the center here, you have these these yeah. lines. Yeah, the, Though that that set of here. lines, and they're yeah, all like unrelated. A square that's been a rectangle that's been broken up. Right. In the very middle of the image. Really strong. But but it's pretty random that it actually ended up there. <laughs> so, which is kind of interesting. But you can see like the double line right there. Yes. That looks like it. This is supposed to go vertically, but then you see this double line, which is almost the exact same proportions, but you can see that it's, it's broken by a plane that they're not connected together in print like those two probably were. Right. You know, it might have been a double, I don't know, probably it shows on the original. Collage. It does show, yeah. And, uh, you know, so all of that, you know, is pretty fascinating, but it adds this whole other kind of you know, like with the asymmetric writings, it adds all this punctuation to the composition mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that uh, that some of the other ones don't have. They have a little bit of that kind of little tiny markings that add punctuation, you might say, to the uh, image. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, this is very pronounced on this particular one because of all the parallel lines going around the letters, mm -hmm. you know, which is... Mm -hmm. Interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fantastic. And, uh, and well worth the extra effort. <laughs> I know it's extra effort, yes. Well, I encourage you to keep going with creating paintings of these. Yeah, so, and a lot of these I would never have thought of doing as paintings, but, you know, if I make them big enough, it's you a know, challenge. Yeah, yeah, it's a challenge, another challenge. Another challenge. And then, you know, you just take that on and see, well, what, what would it be like to go through all that extra work and do all those extra little tiny details? And, you know, it's worth it. Well, we'll have to watch. We'll have to watch see and see what happens. what you do. Yeah. I'll be watching. Yeah. Right. There yeah. We go. So, I'm really excited to have this show here at William Campbell that... I've been in this gallery for 40 years. I think this is my 40th year here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm really thrilled that uh, the William Campbell Contemporary Art Legacy is going to go forward with, you know, a new team of people running mm -hmm. the gallery and, and the expansion into Foch. And yes. It's really great. Yes. So I'm very happy about that and I wish all of us the best of luck going forward. Thank and, you. And uh, it's great. Yeah. Well, we're, we are so pleased to, you know, continue to represent you, Cecil, um, here with the gallery. And we're going into our 50th anniversary of when the gallery opened in 1974. And uh, fortunately, when Bill and Pam decided to retire a few years ago, a group of partners decided to continue on the legacy. Um, and I joined the gallery um, just this year. Um, it'll be almost a year and a couple of months as the director, and so I'm thrilled to be here and continue on Bill and Pam's legacy and working closely with them and have been working closely with, with Bill and Pam for this exhibition, too, of your work. Nice. Um, but we're just so thrilled to, to carry that on, and um, we have the opening reception this evening, which I think will have a, a big, huge crowd. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. Bill and Pam will be here as well. So, uh, Cuernavaca Papers opens tonight, uh, November 16th, and it will go on through January 11th of 2024. So, you will be our first exhibition for the 50th anniversary of William Campbell Gallery. So, uh, we hope you can come and join us at the exhibition here in Fort Worth. Be here. Thank you.